<laughs> Where do you go? So you did a fabulous job. Fabulous Thank job. You really, you really so good. Because it, it's, it's very hard when you, you're looking it's at this camera hard. and there's nobody there. Who am I talking I to? I hope so. Is it worth <laughs> continuing to talk? Anyhow, well done, Hannah. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. There's Diana, Diana Lemaire's join us as well, and Denise Henderson. So hello to you mm. both as well. And Marion, lovely. Wonderful. I'm going to hand over now to the lovely Sally and Sharon. Thank you so much. I like being called lovely lots of times. <laughs> thank you very much, Hannah. And I think we've got quite a lot to get through, so we will crack on, actually. So if you I now hide your video and if you mute yourself um hannah that was actually the thing i was going to tell you a few moments ago when we were having our setup call when we're actually doing talking about this motivation so you can disappear and then there will be time for question and answers folks halfway through so we're excited sharon and i to talk about motivation and we spent on oh, yeah. it was actually this time last year that we were putting together lots of stuff for our motivation curiosity box and i i was just looking in my little notes and i'd obviously been down in cafe nero a bit like i've been this morning and um, there was a little girl down there and i'd written it in a book that i've just happened to get out again and she was probably about 18 months this little girl and she was determined to sit on this chair. But of course she was 18 months and the chair was big and she couldn't get on this chair. Um, and she was so utterly motivated to want to get and sit on this chair. She tried and she did it again and again and again and again. She didn't get, give up and you know, she did it. She managed to get herself to sit on that chair. Why? Just because she could, I think. But Sharon, over to you motivation have you ever yeah. struggled to motivate pupils oh oh my goodness yes and i still struggle i mean yes we have lots of wonderful strategies but there is always there will be something come up and you've got to work through it i mean for example quite recently um and in a minute we're just going to whiz through these slides and then we're going to come off and and speak to you directly again but um no just just one really quick story um i've been I've got a student at the minute who is um, preparing for grade five theory and she loves playing the piano um, and of course at the end of the day you do have to sit and you have to write and it was something like I think about three weeks of lessons and she just still hadn't done the work and to be honest Sally I just felt completely helpless it's that feeling of <sighs> deep breath, what do I actually do now? Um, and there is always different things that we can do. Uh, and of course, the more strategies, uh, the more tools that we have in our toolbox, then we can get these out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that feeling of helplessness. It's that feeling of deep frustration. It's, to be quite honest, rather than actually kind of having a feeling of blame for the student, it's more a feeling of, guilt i think yeah for me yeah. myself i don't know how you feel but kind of it's yeah. it kind of becomes less about the student and it's actually more you kind of really take this big burden on to yourself what am i doing wrong yeah. what am i doing wrong yes <laughs> absolutely and and i know i was absolutely fascinated when i was looking at this um before that actually you know, motivation is a natural state for us all to be in. A bit like that little girl I was talking about in Cafe Nero. You know, we are all mm. naturally motivated. Um, and actually, that if you think about it, the brain loves to learn. It's what the brain does. Um, <laughs> it learns constantly. I mean, Sharon, your, your little boy, Ruel, who's two and, two and three quarters now probably, isn't mm -hmm. he? And he's yes. probably at the peak age for the brain to make all these connections. Um, but nevertheless, you know, for the rest of his life, he will want to learn. And he's learning so, so rapidly at the moment, every day. I'm sure you notice yeah. one oh, new little okay. thing that he's learned. You know, there's no way that his motivation is blocked. And um, I, I think mm -hmm. we need to recognize that motivation is a natural state. We should be. We are naturally motivated because the brain is wired like that, that we all mm. are really, really keen to learn. And I was thinking just before we started about children who come for their first piano lessons and, you know, for that whole first series of lessons, oh, 
oh my goodness me, they are so joyous, aren't they, these children? Because their natural motivation to want to learn knows absolutely no bounds at all. And they are just literally bounding everywhere in their excitement about getting on and learning. Mm. And yet I wonder for most of us whether that is still the case sort of two, three, four years down the line is that natural motivation still there yeah. or has it got blocked somehow yeah. and and even um, sally i would say to that that obviously i teach very differently now but i re i'm remembering back as you say that to the beginners that i took on in my very early days as as, as a piano teacher and where yes they came in so excited because they wanted to learn the piano but back then of course i wasn't um, I wasn't very skilled at what I was doing. And what happened was, we're not even talking about four to six years down the line, we're talking about literally four to six weeks time when I had them just playing middle C and doing, you know, learning 20 concepts. And that in itself, obviously that's not the way I teach now. We at Curious Piano Teachers teach a very different way, but that was one of the things that I was finding. And it was, it was what I was doing. And, you know, they're ready to sit on, on the screen. Yeah, indeed. So I think, Sharon, you, you're going to give us a quick whiz through these seven strategies that we're going to be talking yeah. about. So she's going to whiz us through, and then we're going to come off the slides and talk about each one in a bit more detail. So back over to you, Sharon. Okay, here we go. So here's what we've got. Um, strategy one. Make sure the student has some ownership of the lesson. Strategy two, help students to track their progress over time. The third one is keep moving through the repertoire. The fourth one is manage any student anxiety. The fifth strategy is engage. Strategy six, encourage student self-reflection. And our final one is make it fun. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to come back off. Okay, so let's get again. cracking on, shall we, with the very first strategy. Oh, you watch, I, I can say that word at the moment, but it's one of the words I have problems with. Um, and the first thing is to help the student um, take, take some ownership of lessons. Mm -hmm. That it is the student's lesson, after all. And they don't want to feel as though they don't want to go away feeling as though they've just been told what to do, um, that they have no sense of belonging in the lesson, except as a slightly passive person sitting on the piano stool. So there's lots of ways you can do this, but just to highlight one, um, and that is to get them to write their own lesson notes, or their own practice notes. So I have a couple of stories about some students of mine. I have one student who is 50, oh no, she's just turned 16, and um, she has been writing her own practice notes for about two to three years now. And um, she loves the colour purple, so she has a purple practice book. And I always have lots of pens around um, of this kind of nature, and all my students have access to them. There's another pot, you know, so I have lots of different colours, of pens that the students love to use and they choose a couple of colors that they want to write their practice notes in and um, she will get out her practice book and we'll discuss what she's going to write and yeah she'll write it in and sometimes she doesn't write quite enough detail for me so I'll say why don't you write this um, and if I want to write in her book I do actually ask her permission because she is a, a particular um, teenager who 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 it, it really really is her book very much so um so that's one example and then another one is a young lad who's just literally started in the last this term to write his own practice notes because he's now doing some practice at school so the online tool that we were using cadenza doesn't work for him any longer so he's and he's absolutely loving the responsibility of writing his own practice notes it's absolutely delightful um, took him a little while to get a book. In fact, I think I found one for him. But now out it comes every week. It comes along to the lesson. Um, he chooses his two pens. He, he goes, okay, how do I spell? Because <laughs> he's 11. 
so you know not all the all the spelling is there but it is just lovely to see him grow and and to see him take real ownership of of that element of his piano lessons and uh, of course you can also do other things to help them take ownership like help they can decide what they want to start with what order they want to do things in especially if you have a specific order that you do want to actually uh, cover in in lessons so i think that's the first one for me is um allow them some ownership of the lesson make sure it's not a i do to the pupil yeah the teacher mm -hmm. does to the pupil but they actually have a voice they have some ownership in what's going on okay over to sharon for number mm -hmm. two i think yeah so so true sally absolutely okay so um the second thing is help students to track their progress over time. Now, over time, I don't know about you, but I know that my students, generally speaking, um, they tend to think in the really short term. Yeah, it's they just they don't see the bigger picture. Um, and helping them to track their progress is actually actually giving them the ability to see the big picture. And I know when I was learning at school, I never saw the big picture. I wish, I wish I had, because I would have kind of had some perspective as where I was actually going. And notice when we know, just even in life in general, you know, whether it's an actual destination, we're going somewhere, it's nice to know where we're going. We as the teachers know where we're off to with the student. But the student, it's like we've got this blindfold and we're just expecting them to kind of lead in behind us. And that's in itself is just not motivating. We just want to kind of have this goal, this place, this thing, this even simply this piece that we are going to learn. I remember one of my teachers had said, you know, I'm not going to play for you because if you know what it's going to sound like, then you'll not develop good sight reading skills. Don't quite know where that idea came from. But we play a piece to the student. They kind of see where they're going with it. And they go, yeah, I want to learn that. This is, and that's what gets them excited. That's what gets them motivated. Getting them to record regularly. I think this is everything. And because they have recording devices, you know, whether it's an iPad, whether it's a phone, they have recording devices. You know, this in the 21st century, in 2019, can never be easier. So um, get them to record regularly and then go back, you know, maybe to listen to something that they recorded six months ago or 12 months ago. Um, and basically they just get to see how their skill set has developed. Um, and I, I even did this, I had, and I'm, we're, I know I'm kind of talking about children here, but even just to give you a quick story about uh, a diploma student that I have at the minute, uh, she came back in September um she's not doing her diploma for a while but we had a recording we did a recording and she came in and and played through everything yesterday and it was just she was able to see the progress even though she was still as we do you know there may be i don't know 36 things that we do fabulously but the 37th is that room for development and what is it we focus on the one thing that's kind of not quite there yet. We do what our students do. So um, it's just helping them see that you are actually making progress here. Just want to quickly mention something and I'm just going to hop really quickly back on to share my screen because I've got something I want to show you. This is something that is, um, if you're a member of the community by the Curious Piano Teachers, you will have access to these. And they are their piano trackers. Let me just do this so that you can see. Um, and piano trackers, this is a, a one for beginners. You can see that we have listed particular uh, musical concepts. This is just a sheet here um, on rhythm. Uh, okay, imitating and recognizing crotches. Um, actually making a note of the repertoire that they've been learning and I think as well it is when we we don't teach repertoire we want to teach musical concepts and pianistic skills because that is when if you imagine a, pe a student learns a piece in three four in with crotchets and quavers it's in G major 
But what happens when they get another piece with exactly the same musical ingredients? Do they know what to do independently? Well, they should, yeah? Because that's when they see the progress. They kind of go, oh yeah, I remember using these strategies and I did this and this, so I can count that with them all by myself. I don't need you to help me. Um, so these piano trackers that we have inside one of our curiosity boxes inside the membership area just help students to keep a track of their developing skill base um, and how learning like this is actually they're really getting to figure out things for themselves. I could go on and go on but we've got so many more to go through. <laughs> so, like, on to the next one. No I just love what you said about you know where did that idea come from? This idea that if you play then you'll never learn the piece because you'll, you'll never learn how to sight read. And it, it's just misconceptions. It's one of those misconceptions that just persist and persist, isn't it? That if you play the piece to your pupil, they'll never learn it properly because they'll never learn to read it, you know? And, and it just links up so much with what you've said about being concept led as opposed mm. to repertoire led. Mm. And, you know, I think, yeah. I think what, what the curious piano teachers as, as a group we're starting to realize that is that we have the opportunity to to look at the way that teaching us some teaching has gone on and persisted and really sort of question that and and really think about alternative methods and and find what what it what we can move forward with that's slightly different and probably mm -hmm. slightly better in terms of the way that we now understand learning happens so i just wanted to bring all that together because i thought that was a, a really interesting uh, point that mm. you made and just you know i'm going to talk about this next one now which is keep moving through the repertoire another motivating factor is to keep the to keep the motivation completely unblocked to keep motor, motoring through repertoire and if you have a concept-led approach to your lessons and to your learning by that what we mean is you take a concept such as compound time for example as the thing that is being developed the concept that is being developed and then you find the repertoire that will match with the learning of that concept so if you think about it that way rather than thinking about what repertoire is this student going to learn and then what does he learn out of it um, then you'll find that you don't get quite so stuck on, on, on the repertoire because getting stuck on this three pieces of treadmill, you know, and, and just having students who learn just three pieces a year. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine if somebody said to you, okay, I, I just want you to read three books this year. You can't read any other books, just these three. And once you've finished it, you know, um, you're going to have to read it again because you didn't fully understand it, did you? So would we take that approach with reading? I think not. So repertoire, again, we need to get our students moving through the repertoire, which might mean possibly not giving them quite so ambitious pieces, maybe not always pushing them to the edge of their ability, but actually doing pieces that they can cope with and learn quickly, and then move on to one that is just incrementally harder and so on and so forth. We don't always have to push them to the top of their ability because again, if you're asked to read a very, very difficult book time after time, you will lose all motivation to want to actually read any more things, won't you? So um, I think you've got to be, you know, doing this repertoire um, on a, on a, and changing it on a regular basis. I know I, I'm guilty of sometimes getting stuck I get stuck on pieces because I think, oh, just one more little thing that we need to put in. And then you realize, actually, they're, they're mm. just not enjoying this any longer. So what I tend to do now with students is they ha we have to mark the piece out of 10. And we have to mark it for um, sort of musical integrity. If it's a 7 out of 10, it means that they can play it through from the beginning to end with most of the right notes and most of the right, right rhythms and actually most of the, all the right rhythms on the whole. A steady sense of pulse might not be up to tempo, but it will certainly have the, a, a good sense of pulse and it will have some sense of character beginning to emerge, but it won't be the finished thing. It wouldn't be something that they would go and play in a concert. They don't need to in this particular case. And the, once I've started to do that with my students, they get this seven out of 10. And you can look at them and go, is it seven out of 10? 
and they'll go no and so i then say well what do you need to do let's say is it 6.5 yeah i think so so what what do you need to do for next week specifically to make it into a seven out of ten? Oh, i need to do this and if they they always know what it is they always know what it is that they need to do to take that piece to seven out of ten of course some pieces you know the ones i mean they're just deeply motivated to play and within a week whew, it's way past seven you know it's already up at an eight and i've had one little boy who's been learning detective wombat blues which is a lot of fun and um and it's he, he he just has spent mum said all the time playing it so actually it's been the forbidden piece this week here he hasn't been able to play it because he is due to play it at my piano fest in two weeks time and i don't think the family can cope with it anymore so <laughs> he's been he's been thinking about it rather than actually playing it <laughs> so um keep moving through the repertoire is the third strategy sharon Love that, Sally. I really like that. And I think what I'm just taking from that is that the importance of there being easier pieces, you know, just because a student is grade five level does not mean that they should just be playing that level of, um, you know, piece all the time. They will get so motivated by playing other stuff that's a lot easier and that can, they can learn quite quickly. Um, and also this, this idea in terms of, of concepts and how it's actually, um, you know, if we're just teaching those three pieces a year think about you know and having this repertoire based approach rather than a skill and concept based approach it's so possible for a student to maybe not play a piece and succeed until i don't know grade five because they've just kind of missed them in choices um and of course when students know about when they know what they're doing it's a bit like us you know how our motivation no matter what it is completely drops if we don't know what we're doing so um it's making yeah, sure that the learning is deep okay so moving on should, to the should should we have some questions and answers we did say we i'd forgotten completely we were going to see if there were any questions so i don't know whether hannah do you want to pop in and see uh, <laughs> and open up your your video and your audio hello. Again? there we go hey, hello. Hello. I'm, back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back and are there any questions that you've spotted that we could uh there are, any comments they are melissa glorioso is asking do we have a rubric we use to determine seven out of ten so how do we get to seven out of ten is it a by feel thing i guess or is it a set set of criteria yeah that's a really good question i think as i say i i for me the the piece has to have musical integrity so in other words it's got to start be able to proceed and finish in a fairly um uh, convincing way yeah but it could be that the, some of the musical details are missing um that some of the notes go wrong that there's still a technical problem somewhere um there's just some little hitches that mean that it's not quite fluent that it's not quite finished and it's certainly not polished but really it's up to you and your pupils I think to to decide between you and again this comes back to the pupil choice and giving them ownership you know you can decide for yourselves but I think if they're going to learn a piece then they need to make sure that it has got musical integrity when they when they finish it um, and there was something else that just popped into my head then that I've then gone up I'm actually going to, I've got a, a slide that I'm going to share and just, um, I think it's with the sixth point, yes, that we've got um, on student reflection. So that might actually be quite helpful because I've got something I'm, I'm going to show. So that might actually part the answer, you, you know, partly answer your question with that one. Um, Looking at a couple of the questions here, uh, Lisa is saying, where can I find the piano trackers? The piano trackers are exclusively available to members of um, the community and they are inside, I think it's something like September 2017, 16 Curiosity Box. Um, it's the one about the piano framework. Yeah, yeah. And Susan, Susan Anderson has picked up the point I should admit that I've I, I was struggling to remember because she's saying about if a pupil's not is not getting on with the piece and it comes back two or three weeks just to say yeah. she finds something that he has achieved in the piece and that was exactly the point that I, 
I was trying to make Susan so thank you for that that celebrate what they have learned and what they have achieved point it out also mm -hmm. point out the fact that the piece isn't finished and then move on yeah yeah D don't don't keep going over it if really it's not going to get any yeah. better I think we block so much motivation by actually keeping trying to get pieces mm. perfect all the time yeah you get no to the point where it does. there's no perfect that's that's the silly thing there's no such thing as perfect all, all we're doing is playing in different ways so when you know let's play yeah. with our music in the very best way so play is kind of being curious being inventive having different approaches to the same thing a fixed performance is not something you will hear when you go to a concert hall in the hear a pianist that will sound different the day before and it will sound different the day after so in that particular situation in the concert hall it sounds like that but it is not a fixed performance and that's where we want that's where i would like my pupils to be to have a range of um, interpretations around maybe a central theme that they can choose according to how they feel what they've eaten what the acoustic is like what the piano is like and things like that and also it takes away the fear yeah yeah i'm just going to respond here to melanie yes absolutely printing them off i think is a really great thing and having those piano trackers we did they are designed to be interactive i know it's just possibly with different computers the little boxes don't always tick but they are great to have printed off to have them in a student file because then the students can actually in their favorite color purple pen <laughs> The, um, box. I love Patricia's comment. I love Patricia Russell's I love comment. It too. So it's celebrate the wins that small states, small steps will make big leaps. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay, so Come. should we crack back on with, with uh, your strategy four? Which actually yeah. kind of links with what we've just been talking about a little bit, yeah. doesn't it? Managing student anxiety. It does. Okay, so um, strategy number four, manage any student anxiety. And um, it's about giving students repertoire that matches their current skill set. Um, you know, if it's too tricky, they'll not be able to do it. Um, they're going to feel overwhelmed. We all know that when we feel overwhelmed, we avoid doing it. We know that when we avoid doing it, we then feel guilty. And it just, it's a downward spiral from there. Um, I think the other thing is that and this is from Lucinda McGrath Young, and in her fabulous book, Tuning In, uh, which really helps us get a very practical understanding of, of music psychology uh, as instrumental teachers. And she says that, you know, if they can't do it in the lesson, they ain't gonna feel able to do it once they go. And I've heard a lot in my teaching, and I, I just see the importance of it so much sometimes and I'm sure you can recognize this in your own teaching I know I recognize it in that we help our students way too much you know so we do too much of the what they should actually be taking ownership of in terms of the learning and you know we tell them what to do um, well hopefully we don't because that's the way we don't want to teach because telling is not teaching and if they don't get it without our help in the lesson, they're not going to feel motivated to do it once they go home because they just don't know what to do. Um, so making sure that they feel able in the lesson and that they demonstrate that as well. So this comes back to us as teachers, I feel, this whole idea of proof of learning, that we do something. And I know our time is so limited, you know, typically it's a 30 minute lesson. We feel pressurized to kind of get through this and this and this and this. And rather than actually taking the next five minute chunk and just making sure that there is proof of understanding, that they know the strategy they're going to use to put hands together with that particular scale, um, we move on to the next thing. But do they really know what they're going to do? So making sure that they are confident in what they're doing um, in the lessons so that they feel confident at home is, is really important. Um, and, and so that we're not coming to the end of the lesson going, as I have done so many times, 
Okay, you know, happy with that? You know what you're doing for next week? You know what you're doing for next week? Of course they're going to go, uh-huh, yeah, and out they go. Do they really know? If we just reframe that question and said, tell me how you're going to practice, or show me, demonstrate how you're going to practice your A-flat major scale for next week. And then you sit and you wait. And you'll soon know whether or not they feel able to do that at home. Um, and it's creating that learning environment too where they feel comfortable that if they are not, as we often, I know when I watch my own videos back, I think, oh, how could they possibly understand with the way you've just communicated that? Making sure that they can say, if you haven't explained it or demonstrated it clearly enough, that they can say, I don't know what you mean. Um, so, yeah, Sally, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? This idea of just keeping checking that they, there is yeah. proof of them knowing what they're going to do. Constantly, constantly. And like you, you know, I, I like to think I do it, but I, I think I could do it more. And I think, you know, when we observe ourselves, when we record ourselves, which Sharon and I do quite a bit these days, um, then, then you go, oh, I could have, oh, look, I gave them the answer there, you know, and, and we're trying to move <laughs> away from that because yeah. it is about the student learning. And, and also it's about you, the teacher, having the confidence to sit there and not give them the answer. And I know some teachers have said to us in the past, but that's my job. You know, I feel guilty if I don't fill in the gap, <laughs> basically. You've got to be confident enough as a teacher and certain enough of what it is you are doing as a teacher to sit there and let there be silence for a few moments. Yeah. Did you know, and I'm coming on to the next strategy really, that the average wait time for questions uh, that a teacher asks, I mean teaching generally, the average wait time is 0.9 of a second not even one second. So teachers tend to ask a question, a bit like I've just done there, and go straight on with the answer. What's the key signature of G major? It's an F sharp, isn't it? <laughs> and I think we do it because we kind of look and we start to read our pupil. And we, we think, we know that, oh, they don't know the answer to that, or we don't want them to feel uncomfortable. Mm. Just going back to that anxiety. But actually, maybe they just need a little bit of space to actually process the thought. And I know somebody said to me the other day, and this is in the classroom situation, she liked what I did in that I ask a question several times, possibly in slightly different ways, and say, I'm going to wait for five seconds. And then if you think you know what the response might be, you know, do this or do that or whatever. So that everybody and sometimes it's even asking on. sometimes it's even just asking a different question because sometimes the way we have phrased the question perhaps they just haven't understood yeah yeah so this is bringing us on really to this next strategy which is about engaging their curiosity engaging people's curiosity because we know if we are curious and we are quite familiar with being curious these days then actually you're quite motivated and um it, it really does get you thinking about things in a very, very different um, and interesting way. And part of this is, is asking lots of questions in the lesson. As a teacher, we want to ask our pupils lots of questions, not because we necessarily want to have an answer. In fact, you know, uh, the first thing I learned when I was doing a PhD is there's no such thing as an answer. There were just lots more questions. So you ask a question and actually the answer is the basis of the next question. So it's something I both, I think, again, both Sharon and I do an awful lot of. And I know a lot of the curious piano teachers also because we share our practice um, with everybody not just us but everybody else shares their practice and we learn from each other and we help to develop every, we help to develop our teaching and playing skills as a group and we help to fill in any gaps in the knowledge that there might be for all of us and we know that actually when we ask more questions in a lesson and when we get the pupils engaged in being curious about their pieces for example you know um, get them curious about 
obvious things like, oh, I wonder what key this is in, or I wonder this, or I wonder that, or I wonder who, who this composer is. So for example, we, um, with some of my pupils, we were playing some Cherny, and um, it was something like Cherny Opus 799, number one. <laughs> and to these young, youngish pupils, these were, they were sort of, uh, I think, eight or nine. I said, oh, look, this is Cherny's Opus 799. Now, what that means is, and I gave them the spiel about an opus number, I said, and that's only number one of 12 or something like that. And then we found another piece later in the book that was Opus 999. Well, I wonder how many pieces <laughs> Cherny wrote. You know, we, it turned into this curiosity session all about Cherny, and I called him Churn It Out Cherny. But he clearly, clearly did a little bit. So I think asking questions, asking open questions, what we call fat questions, as opposed to skinny questions, which are closed questions. So a closed question has its uses, and that might be a question like, what is the key signature of G major? Yeah, there is an answer, which is F sharp. And that really is an answer in that particular case. Um, However, that shows some knowledge, important stuff, knowledge. Um, but also important is the open question, the fat question, which might be something like, um, I wonder if you could play the scale of G major using this rhythm or using a rhythm from the piece. Or, and the I wonder question is immensely powerful. If you do nothing else this afternoon, just stick that in your little um, phrase book of things to say. I wonder what would happen if, I wonder what would happen if your left hand played the right hand at that point. I wonder if your left hand could play the right hand melody by itself. I wonder if you could clap that rhythm backwards. <laughs> yeah, you get the idea. You, you just are full of wonder and that makes things really kind of come to life and it, it engages the imagination. I went to a wonderful exhibition two weeks ago, it was up in London and it was at the welcome, uh, the welcome collection, welcome gallery, I think, no, not collection gallery. And um, Michael Rosen, who's the, who's a children's author had put together this whole exhibition about play. And he was talking about curiosity and the importance of curiosity and the importance of play in curiosity. And he was talking about, he suddenly decided one day he'd see how much of the dishwasher he could unpack um, in one breath without, <laughs> so he took a breath and he's, how much of the dishwasher can I empty without taking another breath? <laughs> Why? As you do. Just, just because he could, yeah? <laughs> so I wonder how much of this piece you could play in one breath. And the thing is, it kind of distracts us from all our normal mm. concerns, yeah? Um, it's a bit like one of the most important books I've ever read in my life for me, which was A Soprano on Her Head by Eloise Reichstadt. And the very title gives you the clue, The Soprano on Her Head. She had problems with tension in singing. And so mm. Eloise, after trying numerous things, just got her to stand on her head and sing standing on her head. And of course, the sound that came out was completely different, you know, and it's just these engaging curiosity. I wonder what happens if you try singing when you're standing on your head. Not something I recommend you try with a pupil this afternoon, that one. <laughs> engaging their curiosity is really, really important. <laughs> um, Love it. Love it. And I'm just going to give a big cheer out to Janet. Uh, he has said, I've been learning to tame my advice. Yay. Um, that's one of our members. And we have a couple of curiosity boxes, actually, about this. So, um, yes, I think the title even um, advice must in itself. Um, if you don't know about it, well, mm. it's inside the curiosity box. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on and talk about the sixth strategy which is encourage student self-reflection. And there is something again that I want to share. So I'm just going to pull up this slide again. And um, 
Learning the piano, it's not about getting it right all the time. Yeah, as Sally has just said about, you know, it, we're not aiming for perfection here. And if students think that that's what we're looking for, then um, just so much stuff is, is, is just brushed under the carpet. Um, and this is something that I have used. Uh, it's specifically, I mean, you can use this in lots of different ways, but this is something that I had a student who was just really needed to develop her, her sight reading skills. And we were using the ABRSM sight reading app and per grade, I mean, she was um, working through the, the grade one level. And I became aware that it was all just a bit ad hoc. She wasn't really clear on what to look for. And this kind of links back to one of those questions that we had on guessing was it Melanie or somebody earlier on and we can get students to self-assess for example you know they, they they do a bit of sight reading in the lesson we can say to them okay so how do you think that went but that's that's easy for us to say because we do have in our, in our minds some sort of a checklist you know did they count themselves in how was the rhythm how accurate were the notes? What about the fingering, hand position? You know, were they actually at grade one? It's where you've typically got left hand and then right hand, um, where the coordination's not together. So, did they have the left hand ready for when the right hand free is finished to move on? <clears throat> Dynamics. Did they did they keep going? And my student was just one wasn't very very motivated and i really wanted to, to find a way where she was actually there was some way of, of productively getting her to develop something and this is what we came up with so what she was actually doing and she was doing this at home she would have put in the date she would have put in the site reading number um, and it, the idea was that she used her ipad and she would video record herself playing this piece of sight reading. Well, of course, it wasn't just playing, she was actually practicing it. Practicing sight reading, you might think, mm, can you do that? Well, why not? This is all about practice. This is all about motivating them to get practicing. And she would then have tried it a couple of times, wasn't happy with it, recorded it again. And then she filled in this self-assessment sheet. So she was aware, you know, did I count in? One two, three, one, two, three, before I started playing. And she actually had, she had this checklist. So for me, I find this is incredibly powerful. And it's something that you can adapt in, in lots of different ways. But this really got her going. I mean, things like dynamics, which she just never got to in sight reading. She was actually getting better at all those other areas. And then Sunday was, oh yeah, yeah I, I do know that when I play the left hand phrase, quieter. Than, than the, the opening right hand phrase. So, um, yeah, so getting them to, in order to self evaluate, getting them to use their iPad um, or their phone so that they can record themselves, listen back, consider specifically what they did well, what there was um, room for improvement. Sometimes what I like to do is two stars and a fish, because of course they will always come in with the room for development. Oh, this wasn't very good. It's getting them to really appreciate yeah. those things that they are improving. I mean, what I was saying to this student was like, you're thinking about the dynamics, okay? I could hear the contrast between those two phrases. Um, so this whole idea of being specific, because of course, if we say something like, you know, how do you think you did? Well, that's very broad brush. That's sometimes not very helpful. So being really specific. Um, and if you go over to our blog uh, at the Curious Piano Teachers, there is, I've written a blog about that. If you just put in being creative with the new ABRSM sight reading app, and you can read a little bit more about my journey with Francesca of how I was helping her. And we did this collaboratively. We, we came up with these things because, you know, for example, she wasn't counting in and then suddenly she was playing the first bit. She looked at it too fast and then realized that her tempo she needed to find much more slowly and be much more purposeful. So um, 
Okay, Sally. Am I right in saying that that self-assessment sheet is in the sight reading curiosity box, Sharon? It is. Yes. Yeah. It is indeed. Yeah. It is, and it's not just. I think that you used it for sight reading. I think you can use it for pieces. You know, that assessment idea, seven out of ten idea, is kind of a shortcut way of of doing that. If it's um, yeah. Uh, and that's kind of how I got myself, I suppose, to the seven out of 10. But as Sharon said, it's about the specifics because even as teachers, I find I tend to be too broad brush and, and just having, the, and also you get emotional about it. You get subjective about it. And what that does is it keeps you really objective about now, how was the rhythm? Now, how was, how was the pitch? How was the fingering? Yeah, and it, it, uh, it's just a different way of, of, of approaching it. Just it just funnels it. Just funnels it, yeah. 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 And because it becomes objective, it becomes something the student can work on. That's what they will think. Oh, I can work on that. I can work to address that. Yeah. Whereas when it's subjective, it's about them and them not being very good. And that is what blocks the motivation, just mm. to bring it back to this idea of motivation. So it's the subjectivity of they go, I can't do this, or I made all these mistakes. And that blocks our motivation and natural desire to learn gets blocked by that kind of approach. Make it objective, make mm. it the rhythm didn't work there, or the notes were wrong there. And then they can actually say, see that for themselves, hear it for themselves and say, what I would like to improve is and be really specific in their objectivity. And all of a sudden, they can mm. see a way forward. It's really interesting, just a really quick, quick story. Um, I had a student quite recently, and she'd sent me through a video that she'd said, I'm still not happy with this. And I had asked her to send me through reflections, you know, define, and they were super. They were excellent in terms of reflections. And I, you know, it was detailed off, you know, uh, even from the, the point of reflecting of why she'd hesitated there because the time signature was changing and she was trying to get her head around what needed to happen, moving from 4-4 four, four into 12-8. And there, I mean, it was, it's the fact that, okay, she wanted the playing to be shipped a lot better but it was just these excellent excellent reflections and I remember as a teacher in my early days pre-reflection days brushing so much stuff under the carpet I mean one I didn't really know what to do with it but it was this thing of being just given a license going the lesson can be completely pear-shaped yeah can be completely up the left but if you can sit down have the guts to watch a video back and actually go, ah, oh, okay, this is happening. Then we get, we get to create a plan for what we're going to do to fix it. And that for me as a teacher was so liberating. And really it's what we're kind of doing similar things for our students where we're going, so, okay, you know, let's not go into a kind of whole meltdown because it's, it's messed up and it kind of, it's this feeling of it's never going to be right. Let's just calmly figure out what we need to do, what the next best step is to move it mm. forward. Because then I think it was, it was Patricia was saying about this idea of just, it's the next step. It's, and that's how, that's how we all get there. It's these tiny, tiny steps. Absolutely, Sharon. And you know, if there's any teachers out there who are watching, who are thinking, oh, well, it's all right for you to say this because you know, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, we we have been doing it for a long time, but we haven't always done it in this way. And we know from our own experience that we've done all the things wrong that you've ever done, that we've had pupils who haven't been motivated, um, and that actually every teacher, once you start to reflect on what it is you do, you discover you learn just as much as you teach. And then the joy in teaching really, really comes, comes to the fore. Mm. And you don't get it all right. But actually, like we were saying, there is no right answer. 
there's just more questions and you discover ah okay i'm just going to do one little thing differently and let's see what happens with those students our students are capable of so much more quite often if we just kind of <gasps> released ourselves somewhat and you know just think of one thing that you can take from this uh, whole webinar that you think i could do that i i can do that this week don't try to do all things and if it's completely new to you just do one thing and see what an effect that has okay that's that would be my advice it is mm. possible to change the way that you teach it's possible for your students to get um, unblocked in their motivation and you really will very quickly see really tangible results from their play um really okay we're on to time. yeah we're on to the last one aren't we which is all about making it fun which uh we're both rather keen on doing actually um because you know learning the piano any kind of learning any learning it happens when we are relaxed when we are receptive when we are curious and when we are engaged in the activity and that doesn't happen on the whole if we're anxious if we're being put under a lot of pressure if we were to turn around to you all now and say we're going to bring you all on live and uh, we want you to tell us your teaching in one sentence what you're going to do how do you feel right now don't switch off because you're not going to have to do that i honestly promise you but <laughs> you see when we're having our pupils sitting on the stool if we are not making it relaxed comfortable engaging and fun dare i say it in the very best sense of the word then um then our pupils will block they will block us and therefore their motivation will get blocked as well sharon any thoughts from you how you how you make your lessons enjoyable fun well, I've actually, and I'm going to just hit share again. Um, just want to share this. This is something that I did in a lesson just a couple of weeks ago. And this is the picture. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, can anyone figure out what the piece is or the phrase? Uh, let's see the G clef, the G clef, but that's there on a B. And you can see here that rather than getting the student to write out, as I would have done in my lessons, just using a pen on manuscript paper, here I've got, uh, you again, probably can't see this very clearly, but this is actually on my floor. This is um, spread out on my carpet. It's uh, a big music lesson keyboard and music lesson staff. And I have got little rubbers, little razors. And the student uh, has been learning this particular piece of music. I know um, someone is going to tell me what it is in just a minute. I'm going to be looking in the comments. And you can see there that she has set out the notes, the tone set that it uses, and then has notated it. And it's just a bit more fun than, um, I'm not saying we don't get them to write um, with a uh, pencil on manuscript paper, but it just it brings something um, to life. And yes, it is indeed ode to joy. Mm. So a bit like Sharon, I bring out some of my i have lots of props as you can probably see already around my studio and these are these are three of my favorites at the moment and these are my ducks and um this is kevin this is kevin duck and kevin can go there hello, and kevin. this one hello kevin yes okay named my pupils this is pirate duck okay and he squeaks which they like very much and um including adults i have to say and this is a, a new edition this is super sally duck People bought it because they thought it looked like me. Okay. Um, <laughs> and they can come out in a variety of ways. Um, one of the best ways I use it is for magic number three practice. And they can, my students, I'm looking at what Anastasia said about pupils um, motivated in lessons, but not always motivated when they get home. We'll come back to that in a moment. But they can even borrow some of my uh, props sometimes to take home. If they're going to help them with their practice so the magic number three practice um the the three ducks will sit on one side of the the piano here 
and the pupil will will identify a specific phrase for them to practice then in the lesson like Sharon said earlier they've got to make sure they they you know they know what it should be so they practice it they play it once does it have the right rhythm right notes right fingering and if all those things are in place then do 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 do, do the duck comes and lives on the other side and then they do it again and if it's right yeah the second duck can come over and then if they do it again maybe it's not quite right <laughs> it's very funny when they don't quite get it right and they kind of look at you yeah it wasn't quite there was it <laughs> no well, what was the problem and again you ask them and they know what the problem is and then they're able and it's usually because they don't concentrate to be honest so this is fantastic for helping with their concentration when mm. they're practicing because that's often one of the the issues i think is they just don't concentrate the brain just whooshes off like a little dandelion flower and i think that that's why the whole I mean, really what we're doing here is we're bringing um, the lesson into, you know, where it's a multi-sensory lesson mm. Mm. and it's not just about sitting and yes. staring yes. at what's on the, um, yeah. you know, sitting here. Yeah. Um, it's where we move around, we do different things, could be on the floor, could be... You know, it's 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 getting and it's getting variety in lessons as well can help that fun element. Yeah, I'm just going to go back to Anastasia's uh, point about you know the students. It's it's often when they go home that they lack the time to actually get the practice, and that's another whole kind of area of motivation um, that we didn't focus on today, although it is in the motivation box. And this is really to do with parents. In fact, we have a whole nother box about parents because it's to do with getting the parents involved as well and understanding, um, about this, the, the practice and making sure that the parents fully understand the amount of practice that needs to go on during the week. The other thing to do is with your student, is to negotiate the practice and be really specific so when are you going to practice this week and you're standing there you might take five minutes of the lesson and when it's only a 30 minute lesson i know it's five minutes but if if the if the issue is practice then it's a five minutes that's well worth spending and you know we'll i might have even a schedule and sort of am um before school uh, after school you know and and say okay let's highlight the bits that you think you can practice when do you think how much are you going to get done there okay five minutes there all right and then maybe five minutes when you get home from school so you physically help them before they leave the lesson to decide when their practice is going to be and it's got to be realistic there's no point in saying oh you can practice all these times they've got to say i can only do three practices this week because i've got x y z happening okay that's fine actually just while I think about it, you know, the, the Samantha Coates, who's one of our curious experts, has done a lovely blog about this recently, about how much practice, uh, mm -hmm. what, what practice will equal in terms of the progress that the children make. And again, I think it's a question of educating parents, that the parents mm -hmm. need to understand that the, the, the progress will be determined by not just the amount of practice that goes on, but actually by the the concentration that goes on during the practice okay so lots and lots of things that we're talking talking about there but um are there any other questions because i know we're coming through to the end of the webinar and just while we see if there's any questions that are coming up um just wanted to remind everybody that you know what we're about here at the curious piano teachers is providing teachers like you across the world with the opportunity and the resources for you to develop your own teaching and your playing skills and as i said earlier to help you fill in any gaps in the knowledge you might have because none of us are complete we are all quite holy <laughs> in in what we do and in in the way that we um you know the way what we've learned and what we want to do so rest assured you know that that there are a lot of people who think oh well, i'm not really good enough i can remember think one one teacher in particular you know who said i sat on the sidelines for 18 months and just looked in and thought oh, i'm just not good enough but actually there this is a safe place for absolutely everybody and nobody is made to feel uncomfortable in the curious piano teachers by your lack of knowledge in certain areas instead we have this wonderful community I, and I do really mean that wonderful, safe, supportive community who will help you to develop. 
On the other hand, if you're a very experienced teacher, but just looking for fresh ideas, well, we have lots of those as well. Um, and the, the amount of sharing and the amount of generosity that goes on within mm. our community, I just find uh, incredible, actually. Hannah, welcome back again. Hello. Hello. I'm, <laughs> Hello. Just, I'm just picking up a, um, a comment from Melissa. She says this community has been very encouraging. And I, I'd echo that completely. I've been a member since 2015 and it's transformed my teaching. You know, there are daily things that I, that I think of from the curiosity boxes, from the blog posts, from what I've seen in the group that I think, oh, wait, that's a good idea. Maybe I should try that. Or yeah, this isn't working. Wait, someone spoke about that. So it, it's really, it really is, I can't emphasize enough how much it's changed my own teaching. So if you, if you want to find out more, I'd encourage you to have a look at our website. To be honest, I think, yeah. I think Sally, we, we did say that it's helped our teaching as well, because of course we are not the sole presenters. We have um, had <laughs> in the past and coming up for future Curiosity Box, there's a whole array of wonderful people from William Westney, Samantha Coates. Um, oh, so, so many people um, who have been contributing to our curiosity boxes. And we have learned so much. Just, just the opportunity to kind of dig deeper and to have certain ideas. Just like Sally has just said, it can just be one idea that we actually go into our lessons armed with it we put it into practice and it's what contributes to these success moments and i know i said to a teacher recently about you know thinking about think about a big success moment in a lesson and just remember how that felt you know how both you and your student you know felt so engaged and so and so motivated um and it's when we learn as much as we teach mm -hmm. That's what's happening because we're putting ourselves in that where we actually, you know, the ideas do keep popping up and we kind of go, oh, yeah. And we put it into practice and suddenly it's like, oh, that worked. And it's it, that just, you know, so as, as much as all our hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of members inside the community, it has, you know, Sally and I, our teaching has been hugely enriched by it as well. Yeah, hugely. I, I mean, my teaching has changed so much, I would say. Um, in, in the last 10 years, but in probably more in the last five years, because, because of all the feedback that we are getting and because we're having to think through the step-by-step -step processes that go on with, with everything. Yeah. Um, so our membership site is, is, is always open at the moment, but for people who come along to this webinar, um, if you're interested in joining us, then we do have a special 50 pound, 50 pound discount. Um, I don't have the dollars on me actually at the moment, but, um, but we do have a, a special discount in um, offer that is available. And how did they get, how did they get that, Sharon? Okay, um, <clears throat> once we get this replay um, uploaded, you will be sent an email and the details will be and the links that you need will be there inside that. Um, and also, if you scroll back up the chat, I've put a link to the join button as well. If you scroll back in the chat, there's been a link to the page you can click on to join. So you should be able to just link through from the chat. That we Fantastic. Have today as well. So. Yeah, yeah. And if you've got any questions at all about membership, about you're not sure, or you know, maybe budget is tight or something like that at the moment, and we absolutely appreciate that, that things are, can be tight, especially around Christmas time, um, then do get, get back to us and you know, we're very happy to chat through any, any concerns that you've got. I mean, something that you don't know until you get in there is that actually you get 20% discount off all music from places like Alfred UK, Hal Leonard and Black Rock Music, which is Simpson Sounds now. Um, so you you find yourself you find yourself almost getting your subscription back by the time you've spent your years years worth of music um, and and passed it on to the pupil at full price. So you can kind of uh, uh, make make up what you've lost there. Um, and there's lots of people over there who will help you if you get stuck because we all get stuck and we all need help sometimes. 
Sharon and I in particular, we get stuck with each other, don't we? Well, no, I don't mean it like that, Sharon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but actually, we do find just talking to each other yeah. will help us. Actually, we see the way. And, and, we, and we, every time, Sally, we do kind of go, oh, yeah, oh. we just started it. And suddenly, there is, there is the pathway through. It's so, so it, you know, yeah, it's, it can be so isolating when you're working by yourself. It really, really can be. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you both, ladies. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Is there anything else that you'd like to just say to I our participants think today? Just the one final thing that I want to say is there will be, again, Hannah, I'm maybe just going to get you to pop that link into mm -hmm. the, um, so the join link for those who are on this call are not members and would like to join up. Um, within the next, I'm just looking at the time, within the next five to 10 minutes, the, um, the coupon code motivation will be activated, okay? Um, so all you need to do is click the link that Hannah has just popped there. Um, in the next, just kind of wait for about t uh, five, 10 minutes. Then you'll see a little place for coupon code. If you put in motivation, all in capitals, that will give you your 50 um, pounds discount. And if you sign up, within the next hour, we will also be giving you um, Let's Play, which is um, our online course. Um, Sally, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Um, do I want to talk about it? I, well, I wasn't going to. I was just going to quickly whiz through the, the slides that we've just done. Okay. Just, I can guarantee the Let's Play is fabulous. Really, really great slide um, videos of Sharon and I doing lots of teaching and then telling you what we got wrong, basically. Yeah. So, so <laughs> with with real live children, real live children, completely unplanned, completely. <laughs> they are not rehearsed in any shape or form. What you see is what you get. But I was just going to finish by taking you through very quickly these these seven strategies that we've just looked at again. And we'd love to know one thing that you're going to take and maybe put into practice yourself in your own teaching in the next week. So strategy one was to make sure that the student has some ownership. Here we go. Sharon's got the stuff. Make sure that the student has some ownership of the lesson. There we go. Strategy two, helping the students to track their progress over time. So it's not just sort of not knowing where they are slightly in the blind. Strategy three, keep them moving through that repertoire. Don't get stuck. Keep going. On to strategy four. I'm doing quite well with my strategies. Um, managing student anxiety and make them really as comfortable as they can be uh, by keeping them in towards the top of their comfort zone. Strategy five, engage their curiosity. curiosity. Strategy six, encourage student self-reflection. And strategy seven, which was to make it fun. Well, we hope that you have all had a lot of fun. And we certainly have. We want to say a big hooray to Hannah for <laughs> hosting her very, very first <laughs> webinar. Well done, oh, Hannah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are... Um, around and about we'd love you to come and join us again in december when we'll be back for the final free webinar of the year keep a lookout for that please and i think that's it for me now i'll shut up pretty much it so i'm just going to again say that um if you join within the next hour you will get a complimentary um let's play course so it's worth um, 147 pounds, um, about three hours of footage where you see Sally and I teach. You actually get to see us put ideas into practice. Um, and of course, we always have a 30 day money back guarantee. Um, so if membership is not a good fit, it's absolutely no harm done. So you can get in there, check it out, meet people in the community. And I know many of you, many of you have said, and it's lovely just to see your comments there. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day, um, wherever you are. And um, just saying a big thank you to Pat, who is in California in the USA, and has just said thank that you. 
you are going to encourage self-reflection. Awesome. Brilliant. Brilliant. Go for it. And Brilliant for that, Pat. Brilliant. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you both, Sally and Sharon. That was fantastic. And I know I'll be definitely using some of those ideas as well. So I just want to say a big thank you to you both. Um, I will sign you out, but I will be around for a few more minutes if anyone's got any questions about being a part of the community. I've been a member since 2015, so I'll, I'll hold around for a little bit just in case you've got anything you want to ask me. But thank you both, ladies, and um, have a great week, everyone. Thank you thank so you much. much. Bye.